Hello again. Right, as you can see, this is uh, this is one from earlier in the year. This is I'm part of the big project that I'm working on and have been now for the last year. Quite incessantly. Sometimes I need to take a break from it because it is it's big. But um, this is a print of an image that I called Henosis, and Henosis vaguely means oneness. And as it's all based on one portrait and 25 different angles of that portrait, if you think of it as like a grid of 5x5, five five, um, yeah, this was a dummy run to see how it all was going to turn out. And I'm glad I did it for those reasons, I really am. I mean, it turned out really, it was a long, it probably took, it's an A1 picture, the original. I think if you follow me on social media, I probably did it to death on the work in progress shots with us. Um, but it gives you a rough idea where I'm going to go with this new series that I'm, that I'm working on. I'm just going to take that into place, I forgot to do that. You can imagine what I'm going to do with the final image is I'm going to times this image by five. So it'll be five times across that way, five times up. And that's what I mean if you watched any of the earlier videos that I've posted where I'm working on doing the embellished prints, then you'll have heard me talking on at least one of them, uh, where I'm saying about it being five by five, what it is that I'm proposing to do with this project. But it's a bit like image inducement, it's the closest thing I can find to accurately conveying what it is that is going on. I don't really, I still really, really don't know. It's, as I've said in previous videos, it sort of that makes me intuitively quite aware that I'm onto something. Because uh, uh, descriptive terms fail me. And being born on the day of the commentator, like I am, I'm not usually at a loss for words. Anyone who knows me reasonably well knows the truth of that statement. How many people do you know that shut Josh up? Only Josh. <laughs> and that's why I live like a hermit now. Sorry, I stopped doing that with my arm. I can see how annoying that must be for...
that's another one of those I might work out the, um, the background. I mean, that was a major... It took me two weeks just to do the... Like it has done for the the other one. That, uh, well, one of the versions of the finished... Uh, the image, the finished image. I should perhaps get that over. I was downstairs, I just let a bit, a bit of a transit to go and get it. In another video, which I posted yesterday, of the... Um, Departures in Wonderland, about 25 minutes into part one, I get, at the moment, what I'm working on is the central portrait, across the centre. So I'll establish this, I've done five different versions, and then I've got to do that layer, that layer, that layer, and that layer, and they'll all need five different versions. Like I said, they're taking anything up to this one I'm working on at the moment. is by far the most elaborate. But it's past three weeks on it now. It's going to take at least another one. I can see me working on this particular image until, uh, until Christmas. Easy. Because I've got to go back over a sheet of A1 and that A1 is divided up into one centimetre squares. Each one's going to need my attention with different coloured biros in order to uh, get it to the place that I wanted to go to. So, yeah, quite a time consuming image it's turning out to be. But then I have worked on other things in the sort of interim of, of working on that. It's when I put the grid on things, it, uh, God, it adds to the, it adds to the manufacturing time quite heavily. in Wonderland one. Definitely helps, even if you're going to abstract a portrait, to have a pretty, uh, pretty portrait in the middle of it. Even if you're going to do this sort of thing to it. It's amazing how much you can uh, deviate from a pretty uh, bone structure and yet people will still pick up the indications on it. Well, that's how it seems to me. Maybe they're seeing something else. I'm not giving them the credit that they deserve. That's entirely plausible, so. People see themselves in images, is what I'm saying. Not exactly a revelation, though. Once again, this will be, and this will be, well, it depends how successful it is. But if it goes well, well enough to be a saleable item, it'll be up for the same price as the others, 100 quid. Which, for this, is a bargain. I mean, the original is for sale, but... I've got a price, you can meet it. <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not moving on that. I'm quite happy to hang on to it. Hit the price. I'll, uh, I'll welcome the income from it, but one of the major reasons that I'm glad I did this piece, not the print, but the original, is, I'm going to blow my nose, I'm afraid, sorry, excuse me, um, is that <laughs> I can see and I can see this in all of my work, though, so, don't, so don't get the wrong idea. I, I can see the errors, and I needed to do 
uh, a predecessor version before or a prototype version before I did the you know went right at doing the the final image that I'm going to work through from these multiple compound composite paintings because it, it I can see it in here now now I know what to look for rather than in the vagaries of my imagination. It's not great. People don't want to hear that. It's not like I can see all the mistakes in it, but I can see all the mistakes in all my work. I generally consider what I do. I mean, maybe this is, uh, I should heat this on a deeper level, it's entirely plausible, but I sort of see what I do with this a sequence of errors. I'm, all I've really got back right in my nearly 50 years on this planet. Uh, has been catering for the mistakes when they occur and noticing half the time that they it, it's questionable whether they're mistakes. This image itself has has a very intriguing mistake in the centre of it. So each one of these portraits that I've done you can imagine this is going to take more than an hour, by the way, so there'll be more videos to follow. And like, if it runs through from half an hour, then uh, then I am, um, and I don't round it up at the end, and I apologise now before that happens. We're quarter of an hour in on this one, because my camera cuts out at 50, uh, 30 minutes and just goes on to another file. Um, right, yes, yeah, so one of, what I do is, is I work out a line drawing for each one of these. Uh, uh, portraits. The difficult bit with doing that with this was getting them all to scale. They are all registered off of each other. That was not easy. I took a few months to work out. But I did it. It works. <clears throat> and so what I then do is, is I assembled for this, I assembled the mon this is my light box, you can see the light there. I don't use the light box for photo, I work it all out by hand. I make a big point of that with all of my work. Everything you look at of mine is a, the original and the constraint and composition is done by hand. Absolutely has to be with me. I won't do it from tracing from a photograph. Which is probably a bit archaic, but that's how I am. So then I line them all up and trace off the line drawings, compose the image, and one at a time, and keep them in a row, obviously. And then I got to this one in the centre, which is the only one that I've got to pay attention to, that it is the right way round, because this one and that one, even though they're of the centre and looking out at the centre and there's no real perspective in the eyelids and other points of detailed information that give away that that one's different to that one on that side. It's not a mirror reflection. You, your two halves of your face are not the same. See, I can't mirror that one onto that one. It has to be drawn individually. And so the one in the centre is the only one where that mistake is liable to happen, where I could get it round the wrong way. And that's what happened. When I first did the first tracing, I finished drawing it all out, and you've got to imagine that there, by the time I get to there, I have done, I'm on the 13th, that's number 13 that I'm doing now, and I'm on the 13th uh, portrait within that composition. These 12 down here haven't even been put onto it yet. And uh, I realised as soon as I'd done it, and took the paper, took the paper that I was tracing it onto away from, Oh God, I got that round the wrong way. And there was no way I was going to rub out all and go round and try and figure out which part was the drawing for that and which part is the drawing for all of these. I just wasn't going to, I could have done, it would have been two or three days of testing my patience. So what I did was I just turned it straight over again and did it again, traced it out. So it ended up with a double, like I so said, the left hand and the right hand side of both it. 
It wasn't until I started painting it and putting it together and thinking about that I realised, oh my god, no, what I've done is now that this it, now that, that happens, I'm sort of implying that this is happening on the other side too. So instead of it being 25 portraits, it's the mirror of 25 portraits as well. So it's actually 50 portraits because that central one, which is the linchpin, is actually looking out the other way as well because I made an error early on in the structure and the decomposition. But was that an error? Is that my subconscious going, no, you need it like that? So there you go, there's an able demonstration. You think you know what your mistakes are. Maybe you don't. There's an interesting relationship with tenacity and mistakes. And it seems quite dualistic. It does for me anyway. It can, what I mean by that is, it can be an enormous, you know, bonus to your conscious processing and cognitive processing of what you're doing with the image. Or it can just drive it straight off a cliff. <laughs> that does happen. And it's the tenacity thing that makes the difference at that point. Like, I, you know, there are points in nearly every way. In fact, I look for it now. Where the image, where can I break it? Because once I've broken it, then I know it becomes quite clear what I want from the image because you haven't got it there anymore. It's gone. You can't have your cake and eat it. You, I, you know, I. So then that's it. You got work from your memory, which you were doing anyway, and that's where I like. I so nowadays when I start an image, I just make a mess. There's usually, usually quite a tight confine of a linear structure for the composition. But, I mean, it was for this one, once I had all the line drawing mapped out on it from the 25 different, or 50 different portraits, um, I just chucked in carpet with a break it, smash it up, because I'm going to want to recover it anyway. So I might as well do that. It was just wasting paint. And I can't stand wasting paint. You know, there was it was getting ridiculous that every painting I was doing, I was just pushing to the breaking point. And then that's when the painting got interesting, when it reached its breaking point and I'd lost information that I couldn't recover. But instead of that being the point where I stop, that's actually the impetus to go and push it that much further and it happened so many times consecutively that yeah it, a bit like the reason that I originally started taking line drawings or doing line drawings and taking uh, tracings of them is because I realised it was a massive time consuming element of what I did and once I've got it all mapped out well, I've done it by hand why shouldn't I take it a proof of it and that led indirectly again is that I don't know I find at the age that I'm at now like 50 well ensconced in my middle age is uh, I find that my subconscious is probably at the helm it's difficult to eradicate it as the primary decision making piece of apparatus with my work. In fact, it's a bit of a stupid notion to try to eradicate it. But it's not a difficult thing for a person who's, you know, if you're creatively inclined you're going to get creative with the eventualities of that circumstance. If you're not, it's pretty crippling. Psychologically, I would imagine. It's not fine, I don't find it. I just, I like being visually challenged. But um, 
I hear a lot of the notion of uh, I find art a painful process and I'm trying to say that and retain integrity because I think if you find art a painful process I wouldn't be getting involved in it I don't know I don't, I don't know how you deal with the rest of the world if art is painful to you I, I, what do you do when the news comes on here's rape and pillaging while you're eating your TV dinner how do you deal with that pretty much demonstrated how most people deal with that. Shut it off, I don't want anything to do with it. Didn't work out in a long time. Not as well as I've seen, anyway. There's no way to go about dealing with trauma, running from it. But, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Just having a quick swig of coffee. Yeah, so I'm about 20 minutes into it now. It's going to take a while. Which is alright. I don't mind. I, I don't think I've, I've got loads of others that I'm going to do. And I, it's just a waste of me. I don't, you know, keep on filming them. You get the idea. You can see it in the others. And in all likelihood, they're selling now. So... You're not going to get the one that you see on the video anyway. <laughs> like, so, but, you know, I would, I would spend similar amounts of time. It's often the case that the later ones, I have a much better idea of what it is that I'm doing. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's often the case that the later one, I don't know. There's no accounting for taste. It's often the case that my later work is more refined, but what artist is that not true of? Very few. But it depends what your taste is like. If you like the less refined, more raw work, I'm generally like that at the beginning of things. And then, you know, my, uh, my rational brain starts to take over. So, not a lot. Of, well, I mean, I think there is a, a, like the Russian. I could explain the thinking behind it. I've got a quote from uh, uh, a neurologist, um, famous neurologist, died about five years ago, Oliver Sacks. I'm going to have to watch the uh, documentary on him on Amazon. I haven't got round to it yet, but his book about the man who mistook his wife for a hat which uh, an ex of mine that I've got to get it back to her <laughs> I wonder if she's listening to this um, there's a fantastic quote and uh, I only encountered it whilst I was working on this so it was a bit synchronous but if you bear with me a minute I'll go and get the quote So the quote is, experience is not possible until it is organised iconically. Action is not possible until it is organised iconically. The brain's record of uh, everything, everything alive, must be iconic. This is the final form of the brain's record. Even though the preliminary form may be computational or programmatic, the final form of cerebral representation must be or allow art the artful scenery and melody of experience and action. Now, <clears throat> to me, what I'm when I originally composed this, it did not have, and I don't know if you can see it that clearly. You might see it in the portraits, but the the boundary images, uh, the boundary portraits, that sort of should we say touch the void, the darkened areas, lay it, lay it. Right, well, let's five that way. Three in between now, five, ten, sixteen around the surrounding areas. Four by four by four. 
Is it 16 or 20? 16 or 20, it's one of the two. And within a frame, I, I, I used a grid of centimetre squares to, to influence the tonal gradation that I used for those portraits. The reason that I did that is this line here. This is the final form of the brain's record, even though the preliminary form of, uh, may be computational and programmatic. That is what I am alluding to here. These things that are mostly in profile, you know, and that you're not getting a full frontal view of the, the portrait, uh, are allusions to the, the periphery into the digital world for me. I'm like, that's the metaphor, that's why I've used the grid. And they're like language, code, binary things where it's on off switches. This is the periphery. And then as you close into the center and more uh, more face on version of the portrait and the eyes and the features within the portrait, that's all you can see it. There is no gridding going on there. That is all my organic line drawing replicating upon it, upon itself. And I wanted to keep that organic because that's what that is. That internal square, the point that it comes from is exactly what he's saying, that the final form of cerebral uh, visualisation has to allow art and, what is it? he says, the artful scenery and melody of experience and action. And so it's organic, and that's why I've left it organic. And then the, uh, the extremities, how we interact with that dark void out there that we call the world, is mostly oblique. It's mostly side on for most of us, with bouncing off the surface up a bit. And it's programmatic. You can program it, you can, you can, especially in today's modern technology world and the way it's evolving. And it is computational, and there isn't a better symbol than that than the square. You can literally do what I'm, you can pile them on top of each other and build multiple faces and perspectives out of just by having that, as long as you, you, you play clever with the composition. But internally, it's very different. That's why it's mostly black and white. And there's, uh, for me, this, this, sort of yellowy brown that I use a lot in my images. The reason I use that is that it gives me a sort of feeling of, it sort of alludes to me, maybe I'm getting this wrong, but uh, back to classical Greece and sculpture, like you can see the marbling. And that's what I'm trying to get at. And it's in, it plays, it serves double in here because it's so organic. And that's what I'm trying to say within the center of the image that, it's very organic. Not that it doesn't bleed out into the periphery. It does. Of course it does. But this initial bind with the exterior world, we tend to do for the... We, we rationalise it. We computise it and program programmatise it. So that's, that's the sort of... I mean, there might... There's probably... I'm sure other people see a lot of different things in it. But that sort of, it's not that, I, you know, I'm not here to tell them they're wrong to say those things in there. But that, that's what it means to me. I don't know where we are on time now. Right, yeah, I timed that well. We're coming up to the half hour mark. Right, so as I say, um, if you've seen enough here to keep you going on to the next video, this will just scroll around on to the next video. And uh, it, these are available for £100. Yeah. And if you keep watching, you'll see me working through to the end. Thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll see you on the next video. Or you'll see me on the next video. If you can like and subscribe, that'll be double bubble.